Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Levine, a professor in the Department of Government at American University, and with my colleague, Tom Merrill, I run the Political Theory Institute, the sponsor of this evening's discussion on the work and life of Gertrude Himmelfarb. We have two additional events this semester. April 1st, we have uh, the great French philosopher Remy Bragg speaking on what went wrong with modernity. And on April 15th, Roosevelt Montas of Columbia University on democratizing the great books. Please join us for those. David Brooks once asked, economists measure economic change and journalists describe political change, but who captures moral change? Who captures the shift in manners, values, and mores, how each era defines what is admirable and what is disgraceful? Today's panel is an examination and discussion of the preeminent moral historian of our times, Gertrude Himmelfarb, who dedicated 70 years of scholarship to tracing moral changes and their consequences. Together with her husband, Irving Kristol, she is one of the main voices of what came to be known as neoconservatism. In addition to today's panel, I organized a panel on her thought at the 2020 American Political Science Association annual meeting for which I read several of her books. And I have to say it was a pleasure. Her writing is clear, beautiful, and forceful. Our panelists might differ, but I found it very hard to dispute her overall findings. In particular, I wanna single out three aspects of her work. First, Himmelfarb takes thinkers seriously as they understood themselves. She restores complicated, full, and interesting interpretations to cartoonish caricatures that had been all too often made of many of the thinkers that she discusses, especially of the Victorian thinkers. Second, she shows the complexities of life with a hard-headed anti-utopian framework. Choices, personal and societal have consequences, some better, some worse. That's just the way it is. And third, her systematic meditations on the need for and benefits of morality. For her, morality and manners form parts of the same moral system. She's a moralist. I, I don't know if other people will disagree with this. She's a moralist. And I can't think of anyone of the past generation who have worn that label more comfortably. But a moralist, not moralistic. There's nothing preachy or stern in her voice, just an insistence on the real role of morality in human life and the real and necessary consequences for a world without it. In her book, The Demoralization of Society, she quotes Edmund Burke in a way that to me sums up much of what she wants to say. This is a quote from Burke that Himmelfarb cites, quote, Men are qualified for civil society in exact proportion to their dispositions to put moral chains upon their appetites. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon, uh, unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. In other words, to be free, individuals must govern themselves. Our panelists to discuss her work today include four distinguished public intellectuals. And I'm going to give uh, brief bios of all of them now in the reverse order in which they'll speak. So bringing up the end of our panel is William Crystal, who is founding director of Defending Democracy Together, an educational and advocacy organization dedicated to, to defending America's liberal democratic norms, principles, and institutions. Crystal is also editor at large of The Bulwark, a news network dedicated to providing political analysis and reporting free from the constraints of partisan loyalties or tribal prejudices. Crystal has long been recognized as a leading participant in and analyst of American politics and has sh helped shape the national debate on issues ranging from American foreign policy to the meaning of American conservatism. 
Crystal led the project for the Republican future, where he helped develop the strategy that produced the 1994 Republican co congressional victory and has served in senior positions in the Ronald Reagan and the George H.W. Bush administrations. Before coming to Washington, Crystal taught politics at the University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard. He was a member of AU's inaugural class of signed fellows, and he is Himmelfarb's son. So he's going to bring up the rear and, uh, and, and fill in any gaps left by our speakers. Matthew Continenti is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. In 2012, he co-founded the Washington Free Beacon, where he served as editor-in-chief until 2019. The former opinion editor of the Weekly Standard, he's a contributing editor at National Review and a columnist for commentary. His articles and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. His two previous books include The K Street Gang, The Rise and Fall of the Republican Machine, and his book, The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism, is forthcoming from Basic Books in 2020. He also taught as an adjunct professor here at American University, and he's married to Himmelfarb's granddaughter. Jerry Muller is Professor Emeritus of History at Catholic University. He's the author of seven books, including Adam Smith and His Time and Ours, The Mind and the Market, Capitalism and Western Thought, Conservatism, an Anthology of Social and Political Thought from David Hume to the Present, present Capitalism and the Jews, The Tyranny of Metrics, and forthcoming in 2022, Professor of Apocalypse, The Many Lives of Jacob Taubes. His 36 part lecture series, that's a lot of parts. His 36 part lecture series, Thinking About Capitalism is available from the great courses. His essays on the matters of public policy and international affairs include two cover articles in foreign affairs. Us and Them, The Enduring Power of Ethnic Nationalism and Capitalism and Inequality, What the Right and the Left Got Wrong. And our very first speaker today is Samuel Moyne. He is Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University. He received a doctorate in modern European history from the University of California, Berkeley and a law degree from Harvard. Before teaching at Yale, he taught at Harvard and Columbia. His publications include The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, Christian Human Rights, which is based on his Mellon Distinguished Lectures at the University of Pennsylvania, and Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. He's currently working on a book on the origins and significance of humane war. He has also published in the Boston Review, The Chronicle of Higher Education, Dissent, The Nation, The New Republic, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. So the format for today is that each speaker will speak for 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit amongst ourselves. I'll give the speakers time to respond to what the others have said, and then we'll take Q&A from the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and please include your name and affiliation. Our tradition is to begin with student questions, so students start thinking about your questions now. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to Sam. Sam, thank you very much to, for being here today and please get us started. No, thanks to you, Ellen. Uh, so I'm gonna discuss Gertrude Himmelfarb uh, uh, in, in a cursory and informal way um, as part of a, a, a coterie of, of Cold War liberals. And I think she's very interesting uh, in, in precisely this respect that she forged a set of views that uh, would, would have a, a, a number of interesting sequels, including through our times. Uh, in doing so, I, I really am gonna stick to the earliest period in her intellectual life, uh, culminating in the uh, a compilation of Lord Acton's writings that she published, and then her 1950, uh, University of Chicago dissertation and the book, Lord Act and a Study in Conscience and Politics that followed from it in, in 1952. And, and just make a few points. I'm honestly at the beginning of my research and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing how I can take it 
further. So this book, Lord Acton, is, in my humble opinion, Himmelfarb's best. Uh, and even if you disagree with that, it's quite interesting that uh, our friend Yuval Levin reported that uh, in his personal communications, Himmelfarb had disdained the book, but that he thought everything that followed in her career and many of the attractive qualities of her intellectual life as, as a scholar were already present in that first book. What I'm gonna to try to do is talk a little bit about um, how it came about uh, in connection with what other um, currents of thought and, uh, and, and, and then hear what you think. Another uh, a writer, Jonathan Bronitsky, has, has done, as far as I'm aware, the most uh, important work so far on this early period. And I, I, I assume we're still awaiting his biography of, of Irving Kristol now that Bronitsky is back from writing speeches for, for William Barr. Uh, he, he says, I think quite correctly, that uh, it's, it's wrong to think of neoconservatives as uh, those who trended left for a long time and pivoted right late. Rather, we need to look uh, at World War II and the immediate years that followed. And I'm gonna try to go beyond him on just a couple of points, but above all in refusing to redu reduce Gertrude Himmelfarb to a kind of context for thinking about how Irving Kristol um, made his way in the world because especially in these early years, Himmelfarb uh, was doing some really original things, I think, in the transatlantic intellectual context. And I'll, I'll try to focus a bit on some of these, albeit briefly. Um, so just for background chronology, uh, I'm sure many of us know that uh, Himmelfarb, born in Brooklyn, moved to Chicago after marriage to undertake graduate study in history. Uh, earned her MA there and did an absolutely, uh, I think, transformational stint of nine months in Cambridge, uh, to which I'll come back. She was there to do archival work, obviously, for the, the Acton study. Uh, on return, she moved to New York uh, and published a, a, an initial version of these Lord Acton essays with less input from her, actually, than in in the one that uh, most widely circulated and then kind of set to work writing up her dissertation, keeping in touch with her Chicago uh, instructors. And I, I really wanna just uh, focus on three points that will get it at least at some of the moving parts in uh, her earliest moves there becoming a kind, of, uh, a, a, a kind of Cold War liberal intellectual on the right side of that formation with lots of uh, of interesting moves ahead of her. So the first thing I'd say, looking back at, at, at you know, the materials I've been able to gain, chiefly in the University of Chicago archives, and it was around you know, getting access to those that I, I communicated just a bit and very briefly with Gertrude Himmelfarb at, at the end of her life, I would identify as, as a first significant input into her thinking uh, uh, a a, an interest in going back to a specific feature she saw in 19th century thought. It's often said that Lord Acton uh, gave her a place. It also gave her a time that became the, the enduring uh, kind of era of her study, Victorian England. Uh, but I wanna focus just for a second on how she interpreted that time at the very beginning. Uh, when she published the Acton essays, a, a Harvard professor, Crane Britton, dismissed the activity. How could anyone take Lord Acton seriously after we've read Freud and others? Uh, in her first paper that I think kind of set her on the path of writing about Acton, uh, Himmelfarb in February 1945, uh, actually told a somewhat different story about why she was going back to the 19th century. In the common story, the 19th century was uh, beset by optimism and rationalism. Uh, and that was all transcended thanks to advanced thinkers uh, of the kind Crane Brinton listed. But for Himmelfarb in 1945, it was the reverse. 
uh, that the 20th century looked like a time of optimism and progress, especially in uh, updating liberalism through democracy. And actually it was the 19th century figures who had a, a more vivid sense of the evil and irrationality that always beckon in politics. And it was for this reason that she thought it was is quite important to go uh, backwards. I'll spend most time on this second argument uh, that I see as pretty important in thinking about her earliest moves. As many of you know, she uh, ended up mentored by uh, Louis Gottschalk, a now mostly forgotten historian of the French Revolution, biographer of Lafayette, who was also a Brooklyn Jew and was teaching in Chicago when she arrived. She wrote her master's degree on the political thought of Robespierre under his direction and indeed her dissertation. And we can see her through these years reckoning with the revolutionary legacy. Not surprisingly, uh, in the midst of war, she's thinking about the French Revolution uh, with its now Soviet claimants uh, fighting uh, the Axis uh, before June 1944 in that same year when, when America landed in, in Normandy. I think more interesting is what she does with the American Revolution because it gives us a sense of the kind of liberalism that she embraced. Actually, she wrote this paper uh, that appeared in the Journal of Modern History in 1949, first before her dissertation. And it was in response to hearing a lecture by Friedrich Hayek in London in those nine months when she was there. And she rejected not just Hayek's larger worldview at that time, but his sense that we should treat Acton and Burke as similar figures. Actually, even in many of the obituaries for Himmelfarb, Acton is, is treated as a kind of gateway drug to a mature Burkeanism on Himmelfarb's part. But it's quite important in my view that in her earliest thinking, she thought Acton was very different than opposed to Burke, including in their respective justifications of the American Revolution. Burke, like Hayek, was a traditionalist. Uh, but what was crucial in Himmelfarb's view about Acton and the American Revolution, he more correctly interpreted, was uh, uh, a sense that Whiggism, uh, which Burke stood for, had to evolve into liberalism. And that depended on some kind of ideals that transcended space and time. And uh, Acton's version of liberalism was thus very different than Burkean conservatism. Uh, in, in this respect. And I don't wanna go too far with this because I don't have enough time, but I'll just say it's, I think it's really interesting to think about um, why she thought in the later forties that it was important to keep a kind of traditionalist conservatism uh, to one side and strive for something that um, depended more on enduring or even eternal uh, values. In this connection, I'll just mention that in a 1950 essay in commentary uh, in which she engages with the kind of full range of uh, new conservative thinking in the United States at that time, she engages very directly with Leo Strauss. And I, I see a connection in precisely this respect. Remember Strauss also admiring but skeptical of a merely Burkean conservative. So last point, since I'm sure I'm almost out of time, is her engagement through Acton with religion. Now, I won't be able to say a lot about the study that she wrote. Uh, it's, it's, I think, a quite extraordinary book, uh, especially for a young person. What I will say is that I think her most important intellectual influence was not her formal teacher back in Chicago, but this man, Herbert Butterfield a Cambridge Don who she, whom she met, whom she writes about in her correspondence with Gottschall and whom she acknowledges in the acknowledgements to the Lord Acton study and who, as you see, was working on Acton at the same time as she was. Now, this is an interesting connection because as some of you may know, uh, uh, Herbert Butterfield was very sympathetic to national socialism actually pretty long into the 1930s and traveled to Germany, even in 1938, 
uh, to maintain his contacts and give lectures. In the mid 1940s, when Himmelfarb shows up, he's become uh, a, a different man and is, is evolving himself to a kind of Cold War liberal. And in both cases, they place a kind of a neo-Orthodox religiosity quite central to the version of liberalism that they um, evolve together, one an, an, a, a middle-aged Englishman and the other uh, a kind of interestingly, a young uh, uh, American Jew. In her study of Lord Acton, uh, Himmelfarb of course does something that's quite relevant now, which is to insist on how Acton with his German contacts, Ignaz von Dullinger, et cetera, had to resist papal reaction. And you know, given the rise of the Patrick Deneens and Adrian Vermules of American conservatism today, I think it's quite interesting that for Himmelfarb at the start, it was incredibly important to have a conservatism that, that looked right and resisted uh, the kinds of authoritarianism that Lord Acton did. But at the same time, it was crucial to fuse a kind of neo-orthodoxy in religious matters with a liberalism in politics. It's also in the name of a kind of neo-orthodox Judaism that Crystal uh, devoted many of his early commentary essays when they, the two both returned from, uh, from Cambridge in 1947. So I've made these three points. They're really just constituent elements in a kind of very distinctive, interesting Cold War liberalism that, uh, that Himmelfarb, I think pioneered, helped pioneer in these transatlantic relations. And what I need to do in future is think about, you know, kind of how we fit them all together. I'll close with this archival document really to allow me to end with a plea. It's a letter from Irving Crystal back to Gottschalk once uh, 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 the couple had returned to New York. Uh, he did what all editors do, which is solicit a review and Gottschalk said he was too busy. But uh, 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 he closes with this interesting uh, line that uh, he sends regards from his wife and cackles from the ghost of Lord Acton. What I've tried to suggest today is that those cackles are really important in establishing Himmelfarb as an interesting intellectual figure. And I think we can hear them even now if we listen closely and follow the trajectory of the conservative movement. I'd also love, since I've been showing archives, uh, archival documents to ask the family if they'd let me see anything from this era that they may have retained so I can do a better job next time in talking about uh, your, your, uh, your lost relative. Uh, my condolences. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. Jerry, you're up. Okay, uh, so I want to talk about Gertrude Himmelfarb uh, in what might be called her middle period uh, between the publication of her book on Lord Acton in 1952 and her move to Washington in 1987. So from the ages of, of 30 to 65. Uh, during the first part of that period, she was an independent scholar, uh, not attached to any university. From 1953 to 1958, she was living in London where her husband Irving was the founding editor uh, of the journal Encounter, published by the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And then they moved to New York um, in 1958, where Irving worked first as a journalist and then as an editor at Basic Books. In 1965, she began to teach at Brooklyn College and later at the Graduate Center of CUNY. And in 1987, they moved to DC. Uh, I owe both uh, Irving Crystal and Gertrude Himmelfarb a lot in terms of intellectual stimulation. Uh, my forthcoming book, uh, Biography of Jacob Taubus, was actually their idea. And in the case of Gertrude Himmelfarb, um, she's been for me an exemplar for the writing of intellectual history. And it's in that capacity that I want to talk about her. My first encounter with her work as an intellectual historian was in my first year of graduate school. And it was in her book, it was with her book, Victorian Minds, 
which is a collection of essays that were originally published between 1952 and 1966, and then published as a book in 1968. So after the completion of her first book on Lord Acton. Uh, I was struck then, and I, in rereading some of the essays, I was struck now by her ability to take past thinkers and reconstruct aspects of their thought in a way that was accessible to a general reader, completely free of jargon, and in each case to provide a revisionist view of the thinker in question and subtly indicate that this might incline one to revise one's own preconceptions about some larger issue or current of thought. Uh, the first of those preconceptions was about the term Victorian itself with its then associations of thought and styles of life that were stuffy, outmoded, or puritanical. Uh, her exploration of these thinkers showed that that was anything but the case, that these were thinkers who were deeply interesting, conflicted, and insightful. There's no explicit dominant message in these essays, but what I think holds them together, and this is uh, related to Sam's theme, is a theme that was adumbrated by her older friend, uh, Lionel Trilling, in his book, The Liberal Imagination, a collection of his essays published in 1950, and a book that is in many respects about the limits of the liberal imagination. Trilling's premise, and I think Himmelfarb's as well, was that liberalism was the dominant style of thought at the time, and that it was therefore incumbent upon liberals to recognize the characteristic limits and pitfalls of liberalism or progressivism. And that is in some ways what Himmelfarb was doing in these essays in Victorian minds. So take, for example, her essay, The Haunted House of Jeremy Bentham, uh, first published in 1965. Bentham, to remind you, was the founder of utilitarianism and of that sect of reformers known in its day as uh, philosophical radicalism. That is to say, people who were given to scrutinizing all laws and legislation with an eye towards demonstrable utility and on the assumption that self-interest was the dominant uh, motivation of all human action. Her essay is about Bentham's plan for a panopticon. That is to say, a plan for a prison in which inmates would be confined to separate cells around a central tower in which a watchman would stand so that each prisoner would be constantly and efficiently surveilled. Uh, Bentham had an elaborate plan to specify what they would eat, how they would re be remunerated for their work, and so on, all with an eye towards maximizing the utility for the public and for the operator of the prison while treating the inmates in a more humanitarian fashion. And it's noteworthy, and she underlines this, that Bentham planned to run this prison himself. Uh, and it was designed in keeping with utilitarian ideas to provide the greatest happiness to the greatest number. And Himmelfarb explored this plan in depth and showed that it was at odds with any notion of uh, rights or liberty. And Himmelfarb characterized the panopticon as, quote, nothing less than the existential realization of philosophical radicalism, unquote. And then uh, she continued analyzing Bentham uh, in an article on his plan for pauper management, uh, the management of paupers, not the Karl Popper sort, but the poor. Uh, uh, an essay that she published in 1970 and it's reprinted in her collection, Marriage and Morals Among the Victorians. Now, the Panopticon was something that almost no one had heard of when, uh, when Himmelfarb wrote about it in 1965. Today, it's most familiar to many people who have heard of it um, because of the attention devoted to it by Michel Foucault in his book, Discipline, and Punish, uh, first published in French, uh, really under the title Surveil and Punish. Uh, it's interesting, and that was published in 1975. It's interesting to compare their two treatments um, and worth remembering that although Foucault doesn't mention her and hadn't read her, um, his, her study was published a decade before his. But here's the difference. For Foucault, 
the Panopticon was the paradigmatic institution of modern society. While Himmelfarb pointed out that it was never actually adopted. Rather, it was a kind of warning of the logic of a certain kind of utilitarian progressivism taken to an extreme. Think about nudge, but very hard. Uh, let me focus on another of her essays in that collection, the uh, one called The Other John Stuart Mill. And this too was a critique of a strand of liberalism, a critique that was all the more interesting for coming from John Stuart Mill himself, the saint of liberalism in many respects. Uh, it was first published as the introduction to a volume of essays by John Stuart Mill, essays that Himmelfarb had retrieved, edited, and published in 1962. And the, it in, that collection that she put together included Mill's essays on uh, Bentham and Coleridge from the 1830s, on the Tocqueville from the 1840s, as well as a number of his late essays on parliamentary reform and on theism. Her purpose was to show another side of Mill, another side that is compared to Mill's most famous work on liberty with its defense of the one very simple principle that quote, the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their numbers is self-protection, unquote. And her purpose was to show a more complex mill and in many respects, a more conservative mill critical of many of the key ideas of on liberty. Himmelfarb attributed the monomaniacal radicalism of On Liberty to what she saw as the malign influence of Mill's consort and later wife, Harriet Taylor. And Himmelfarb also showed how Mill had reversed his position regarding socialism under Taylor's influence. And that argument she expanded in her book of 1974 called On Liberty and Liberalism, The Case of John Stuart Mill. Here again, the message was that contemporary liberals ought to read more of Mill and that in doing so, as Trilling put it, they, they would, quote, put under some degree of pressure the liberal ideas and assumptions of the present time, unquote. Himmelfarb's best book by my lights was her book, The Idea of Poverty, uh, England in the Early Industrial Age that she published in 1984. Its origin was in her investigation of Bentham's pauperism scheme, but some of its motivation seems to have come from contemporary discussions associated with the war on poverty in the United States of the 1960s and its apparent uh, limits or failures, a topic that was central to the journal founded by her husband Irving, uh, The Public Interest, and edited by him first with Daniel Bell and then with Nathan Glazer. The, that book carried the story from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations of 1776 through the mid 19th century. And the book was and is re remarkable for its scope as it followed debates about the nature and causes of poverty from political economy through politics, pamphleteers, legislation, literature, and journalism. Because it put the ideas of each author or movement like chartism into the larger context of their thought, it was a virtual intellectual history of the early to mid uh, Victorian era seen through the lens of thinking about poverty. I can't begin to describe the range and depth of the idea of poverty and the light that it casts on thinkers from Adam Smith and Edmund Burke through Carlyle, Engels and Dickens. I can just say, if you want to experience intellectual history at its best, read it. Uh, and one can't help but be struck, as Alan already mentioned, by the subtlety of her analysis and of her formulations, including, for example, her observations in the introduction on the relationship between language and reality. She wrote there that a concern with the idea of poverty does not, quote, imply any priority or determinacy for ideas in general or for this idea in particular. I would not say, as did R.G. Collingwood, that all history is the history of thought, or even that the history of thought determines all of history. I do believe, however, that there is a history of thought in all of history, and that the two are often intertwined and interdependent. Even the hard facts about poverty, 
about wages and prices, employment and unemployment, living and working conditions appeared to contemporaries as facts and functioned as such only as they were mediated by a structure of ideas, values, opinions, beliefs, attitudes, perceptions, and images. This does not mean that nothing was real unless contemporaries thought it to be so. Now, a few years after she wrote this, there was a turn of historical fashion to what was dubbed the linguistic turn. But Himmelfarb in this passage had already said almost everything sensible that there was to be said about it. Uh, the idea of poverty was followed by a, sec a successor volume called Poverty and Compassion, the Moral Imagination of the Late Victorians, which dealt with uh, the most significant attempts to delineate the nature and extent of poverty and the solutions offered uh, from the rediscovery of poverty in the 1880s through the social legislation preceding the First World War. And as so often the case with Himmelfarb's works of intellectual history, we were transported into a time and place far from our own, yet not so far to be entirely unfamiliar, and were allowed to converse skeptically, but without condescension, with serious men and women about the most serious issues. So let me conclude. Some readers of, the, of these books of the idea of poverty uh, were puzzled or even put off by the fact that so historically rich a book does not have an explicit thesis. And that was true of poverty and compassion as well. The Victorians, Himmelfarb continued that book, have no solutions to our problems, if only because their problems are not ours. But the book did remind its readers of what so many public policy analysts from time to time rediscover, namely the inseparability of the moral and material dimensions of such problems, or to use another vocabulary of cultural capital as well as capital. It's characteristic of an ideological work of history that it, prevents, that it presents facts and only such facts as lead inevitably to its author's own conclusions. Himmelfarb's two volumes on the problem of poverty, while they were originally motivated by contemporary questions, led not to inevitable answers, but to better informed questions. Uh, some of Himmelfarb's later work did become more ideological, not always to their benefit, I think. But at her best, which was most of the time, she modeled the calling of the intellectual historian for me, and no doubt for many others as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jerry. Matt Continetti. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Sam, Jerry, and Bill. Um, I think I'd first start by just uh, recommending everyone visit uh, the website contemporarythinkers.org, uh, where um, all of Himmelfarb's work is uh, indexed and uh, sources are available to all of the books and articles that we've been discussing. And also uh, there are pages for other of the Cold War liberals that Sam talked about, including Irving Kristol and Lionel Trilling and Nat Glazer, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm gonna be slightly more informal in uh, the way I refer to our subject tonight. Um, she was to me as she was to uh, all of her friends and family, uh, not Gertrude Himmelfarb, but B. Kristol. And so that's how I'll be uh, uh, referring to her in my, my remarks. So if Sam discussed the early B and uh, Jerry kind of discussed the, the, the bulk of her career, uh, uh, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about what she wrote about contemporary questions uh, from that period when she moved uh, from New York to Washington DC until uh, really kind of the last decade of her life, um, which is not uh, so much covered actually in the way we divided this panel, but the last decade of her life um, uh, two decades really, she focused on um, questions surrounding the Enlightenment and also uh, Judaism. Uh, and since we're all mentioning our, our favorite books of bees, I would say mine is actually one of her final books, The People of the Book. It's a very short book and so easy to read, but it is about uh, philo-Semitism in um, Anglo-American uh, Anglo, uh, thought, uh, British thought particularly. So in some ways, as I think has already been uh, brought up, uh, the contemporary society was always in the background of B's uh, scholarly work, uh, whether it was the early Cold War or whether it was the debates over the war on poverty. Uh, it was sometimes alluded to, often somewhat implicitly contrasted with 
uh, the intellectual and moral climate of the Victorian era, uh, which she so um, devoted herself to. But it was not really until uh, the late 80s and early 1990s that she began dealing directly with uh, contemporary American social and political questions. So we might ask why then? Well, as was mentioned, um, she had retired <laughs> from her teaching and moved to Washington, D.C. with her husband. Uh, and of course, Washington, D.C. is a very political town. Uh, when Irving Kristol wrote about their move in the New Republic, he devoted a whole essay to the move. Uh, he talked about how New York had lost some of that intellectual vitality, which had inspired him um, for most of his life. And he was rediscovering that vitality in Washington, D.C. So that may have um, nudged me to tackle uh, some more pressing issues. Uh, I also think it's important uh, to recognize that um, she was doing a lot of writing about the changes in historical practice and historiography. Uh, and it was the, uh, many of her essays surrounding this subject were uh, collected in her book, The New History and the Old. And I, I think it was through this work uh, that she began to see the effect of postmodern techniques and ideas on her own profession. And so that I think then raised the larger question of postmodernism's uh, um, influence on uh, society as, as a whole. And then finally, I think uh, this turn toward the contemporary uh, could also have had something to do with changes in American conservatism itself. You know, with the, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the rising importance of the religious right uh, to their movement into the Republican Party, Conservative intellectuals in this period began paying more, much more attention to social disorder and cultural permissiveness. And so it became um, kind of the, the tableau uh, for them to um, uh, project their ideas about, about how the world worked. And she, um, in a 1997 essay, discussed how, um, and I quote, the absence of any external threat to the country, a welfare state woefully deficient in soul craft, a multiculturalism that has fragmented society and a postmodernism post that has deconstructed the culture. The combination, she said, is proving nearly fatal to our sense of national identity and pride. But if the Whig historians wrote the history of the past through the lens of the present, uh, B attempted to write about the present through the lens of the past and specifically the Victorian era uh, in which she held such expertise. The great theme of her writing on contemporary issues was what she called uh, the moral revolution, uh, what uh, David Brooks was uh, uh, writing about in Alan's uh, introduction. And she described this revolution as a revolution in the manners, morals, and mores of society. And she located the beginning of this revolution sometime in the 1960s, though it had antecedents in the 1920s, and then with, uh, say, beat culture in the 1950s, but really kind of exploded onto the scene in the 1960s and changed the culture in ways that persist to this day. So in her work in the 90s, she described the topology of this revolution and as well as the considerable extent to which it reshaped American attitudes and behaviors. And she did this um, through uh, measurement. She did it through analysis of what the Victorians had called the moral statistics, indices of two parent families, uh, crime, addiction, welfare dependency. These had come up uh, in her work on uh, Carlisle and the condition of England question. And so much of her writing in the 90s was kind of um, a transposing of that framework to America, the condition of America question. And the condition was, was not good as we found it. Society, she argued, had been demoralized. It had been divorced, I quote, from any moral criteria, requirements, even expectations. And this reluctance to issue, this is me talking, this reluctance to issue moral judgments or to condition, say, welfare on appropriate behavior, moral conduct had led to policies that subsidized and even rewarded self-destructive behaviors and conduct. I quote her again from 1997. The welfare state, she said, is objectionable not only because it is big government, but because it is bad government. The English who have had more experience with it than we have call it the nanny state. It treats individuals not as adults, but as wayward and provident children who require the constant supervision and protection of their guardians, which is to say legislators, bureaucrats, social workers. 
that such a state is inefficient, costly, cumbersome, corrupt, or the least of its vices. Its real offense, she concluded, is that it is just demeaning and demoralizing to those who come under its not too tender embrace. So it was this ethos of liberation from restraint and its corollary non-judgmentalism that was responsible for the demoralization of society. Like many neoconservative thinkers, B identified this ethos with the adversary culture of the new class, a culture that criticized and delegitimized traditional institutions and its inheritance in this class of politicians, lawyers, educators, government workers, and figures in the arts, entertainment, and media that propagated throughout American society. What the Victorians had proved, be said, was that a growing economy did not inevitably coincide with social decay. Both the economic and the moral statistics could show improvement if the values of thrift, self-control, moderation, delayed gratification, industry, and civility were dominant in a society. In Victorian England, such values had been promoted by two rather dissimilar sources, utilitarian philosophy on one hand and Methodist religion on the other. Now there is no way, easy way to replicate the Victorian successes. And while B approved in general of efforts to bolster the intermedi intermediary associations of civil society, such as family, neighborhood and church as counterweights to this nanny state. She also in typical neoconservative fashion qualified her support. And in fact, one of her first major articles for the Weekly Standard after it was created in 1995 was a, a criticism of the civil society efforts. Civil society, she said, might not be able to bear the burden that of the charge placed upon it. Civil society, I quote, had, has been described as an immune system against cultural disease, but the fact is that much of civil society has been infected by the same virus that produced that disease. The relativism permeates those institutions of civil society that reformers were trying to uh, put more and more responsibility for social uplift onto. So the ethos of liberation was not contained to the political sphere. It had spilled over into the moral cultural sphere as well, where values are formed and ranked. And consequently, it demoralized the very mediating structures on which the civil society reformers placed so much hope. So it was not enough, she said, to revitalize civil society we have the far more difficult task of remoralizing it. And in some cases, she said, this task would have to be conducted through political means, through the use of law and government, which was another of her criticisms of the civil society movement, that they neglected the political, they neglected the role of government, that it had its uses. And I think the clearest statement of her views on contemporary America, though it's not so contemporary today, it was published 20 years ago, are contained in the book, One Nation, Two Cultures, published in 1999. Here B contrasts the dominant culture of the opinion shaping new class with what she called the dissident culture of religious and social traditionalists. The distinctive features of our two na nations, she wrote, are ethos and culture rather than class, race, or ethnicity. And B was not optimistic that the dissident culture would displace the dominant culture anytime soon, but she held that the two cultures might achieve something like an equilibrium and that the dissident culture could serve as a let us say safe space for orthodox religious behavior uh, believers as well as secular traditionalists. And I think it's interesting having reread this book uh, just recently um, to, to think about how the two cultures stand uh, today because it's not so clear to me anyway that the categories hold up. Um, the dominant culture uh, is in itself in a process of transformation on the one hand, there's a culture of repudiation within this dominant culture that wants to tear down uh, even liberal institutions. And there are also, of course, the trendy phrase, a cancel culture that wants to kind of remove um, uh, anything offensive to the new morality. But the dissident culture itself has revealed um, uh, pathologies. It also contains antinomian and anti-bourgeois forces of its own. And in fact, as Charles Murray um, remarked in his review of One Nation, Two Cultures when it first appeared, and then of course uh, revealed in his major 2012 study coming apart, it is the dominant culture, the dominant cultural elites who are more traditional in their behaviors than the members of the dissident culture. 
So the problem for Murray was that the elites simply do not preach what they practice. And this complicates, I think, um, kind of the, the schema of one nation, two cultures. It's also interesting to note that in the years since uh, One Nation, Two Cultures was published, uh, intellectuals have shifted their intentions from the so-called underclass of the primarily urban poor to the working and middle classes. And they've also come around to the view that the condition of the nation question might actually best be resolved through economic means. Even thinkers on the right today, if you look at contemporary debates, seem convinced that economic policy and not moral reform is the best way to improve the lives of ordinary people. In fact, I can think we can find many more examples of attempts at moral reform coming from the left than we can uh, on the right. Now, it, it is true that many of the trends that so concerned me 25 years ago, crime, welfare, dependency, teen pregnancy for, for, for a few have improved, but others have not. Uh, the numbers of one, children living with one parent continue to rise, drug and alcohol addiction, has uh, lowered the national life expectancy um, even before the coronavirus. And the behavior of the ex-president, especially in the months since he lost re-election, vividly illustrate the importance of character, not only in private, but also in public life. And so as I was re reflecting on uh, Bee's work in the 1990s and rereading through some of her essays, uh, a quote of Leon Trotsky's came to mind, uh, which I will paraphrase. So you may not be interested in morality, but morality is interested in you. And just finally, uh, to end on a brief personal note, I also came across uh, a remark of Bee's. She said of her friend, Amy Cass, that she was a rare human being and a very dear friend. And I can't think of any better words to describe Bee Crystal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, let me just uh, remind the audience, if you have questions, to please submit them to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And uh, our last but not least panelist today, Bill Crystal. Thanks, Alan. I think I will be the least on this, on this panel because I, um, you know, I come prepared sometimes. To, I've been on a few of these uh, various discussions about my mother, and I come prepared with sort of a few points to correct some of the common, I think, misunderstandings, well-intentioned misunderstandings of her life and work. And But there have been none on this by any of our three, three speakers, so I have very little to, to correct or to say. But thank you, Alan, for putting this group together and thank all of you for uh, your work. I mean, th these have been very interesting, honestly, and I think also suggest further interesting discoveries or reflections and parts of her work that haven't been quite as, uh, maybe quite as well known as, as, as other parts. Um, I think she would have liked this panel very much. Uh, she would have liked the fact that her work was being taken seriously, but but not overly earnestly or reverentially. And, that, and she would like the fact that people are looking at these books with fresh eyes and not necessarily putting them into some Procrustean bed of a certain group or movement or the times or, and really, you know, Acton's very different from Burke and she appreciated both of them and, and she appreciated uh, conservatives and Tories and uh, sort of uh, Israeli and John Buchan and all kinds of characters. And she loved George Eliot, who's, you know, caricatured at least as the kind of most earnest Victorian liberal. She always, and I think both, uh, all three of you really made this point. I mean, she very, she really tried to treat these thinkers with respect. And I think one thing she learned very early is the caricatures of them, the cartoon versions of them are just wrong and uh, silly, really. I mean, Acton, I don't you know, Sam must know more about this than I do, but I, my impression is that people didn't understand Acton at all when she and Butterfield, and I guess Hayek also played a role in this and rediscovering him, they thought, you know, he had these kind of complicated, these essays on freedom and antiquity and modernity and so forth, but then he had this slightly bizarre religious side and no one really saw how it fit together. Uh, she took him seriously with the, the, and the importance of religion and its compatibility with liberty, at least Acton. Uh, so Acton thought, but that's so true of, I think, of her work on so many of these other thinkers, uh, Victorian Minds, uh, the, which came out, I guess it was in 65. So I read that sort of, you know, as a high school student, I guess. And so I, that one maybe made the most impression on me. 
they were all different minds, you know, and the cartoon version of Victorianism was uh, this, you know, the Victorian era, and everyone believed in certain things, kind of propriety, but also a kind of dopey 19th century optimism, and they couldn't come to grips with the horrors, and they couldn't possibly have understood or glimpsed the horrors of the 20th century, and they couldn't have glimpsed all the counter arguments, and I think what you found is that each of these thinkers, him or herself, had different views on these things, and many of them had complex views and uh, qualifications of their main views uh, themselves. I mean, that's very much of a theme of her work, and she rediscovers, you know, uh, aspects of work of people's work, Mill maybe most famously, uh, that had been neglected. She corrects herself a couple of times. She she didn't like her first essay on Burke. I think it was her first published essay was on Burke. Uh, she grew not to like that essay and uh, wrote a, another essay explaining how she'd been wrong. And I think she changed her mind somewhat on Mill and on others, which is, I think, rare, I would say, in my experience in both academic and intellectual <laughs> life uh, and impressive and a good lesson, honestly, in, in trying to read these thinkers in a serious way and um, and learn from them, not just put them in different categories and and so forth. I would say I, I was struck that all all of you uh, emphasized to some degree the I don't know didn't emphasize as much as some people do the conservatism of of, of my mother's thought and 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 work and emphasize or emphasize the complexity of the mix of conservatism and liberalism. You know, we it's nice that you each have different. Um, favorite books, that's maybe a tribute in a way that, uh, I don't know what's a tribute, tribute to the fact that you didn't write the same book, you know, 15 times. And so different people found different thinkers and different treatments and different arguments uh, differently interesting. I, I rather like the moral imagination the most. I, I don't know exactly why. I think my mother liked it a lot. I mean, she, she this, these are essays she collected and rewrote pretty considerably and were published in 2006. So she was already quite uh, in her eighties, but she thought these were kind of, this was kind of her final statement on thinkers she really admired. And she she rewrote them. And I remember at the time, and I think she may, she may say this somewhere, someone said, we shouldn't rewrite these. These are historical documents. You said, you know, you've got to leave them as they were. It'll confuse future uh, students to sort of, and, and she, I mean, of course, you can go back and look at the original essay, so it's not confusing. But she said, no, I mean, I'm not a myself, like some great thinker who has to leave the original work intact. And she was so modest in that way. Uh, I, I want to give my best judgment, my best appreciation of these thinkers. So this book is more appreciations than, than maybe some of her other books. But And these are the thinkers who really meant a lot to her very elegantly discussed in this book. And I'll just read it like for a second, the, the thinkers who were discussed, but I think it gives a sense of her intellectual world and the, com the complexity of it um, and the uh, uh, kinds of figures she found so interesting. Edmund Burke, George Eliot, Jane Austen, uh, Dickens, Disraeli, John Stuart Mill, Walter Badgett, John Buchan, the Knoxes, uh, Michael Oakeshott, Winston Churchill, and Lionel Trilling. And so that's an interestingly diverse group. Um, some would be called conservatives, some would certainly be called liberals, some would be more wakish liberals, some would be, there are those who were religious and those who were um, friendly to religion but not religious and, and those who were not particularly interested, honestly, one way or the other uh, in, in religion. Um, in the preface to this book, there's a very interesting discussion of a great tribute to Trilling and Trilling's understanding of complexities, subtleties, complications, ambiguities. And she very much associates herself with that. Um, she also very much, I think she discovered this essay fairly late in life, William James's uh, uh, discussion of uh, once born and twice born intellects. And she very much liked William James's sense of the twice born, those who are not, who have complicated, ambivalent, sometimes tormented, views of things, incapable of the easy, comfortable, optimistic demeanor of the once born. I think that's fairly um, consistent in her work. She's skeptical of complacent optimism that at the beginning that makes her a critic of progressivism, I'd say in the sort of simple sense of it, that, you know, things are getting better and, um, and uh, if only we don't mess up something, you know, it'll keep, keep on doing so. But she was also skeptical of the conservative version of, you know, uh, version of or antidote to progressivism, I suppose, which would be if only we could go back to some mystical golden age or get rid of the following problems, everything will be better. And so I, I think in both these areas, she was um, uh, neither as, by any means, neither a progressive nor a, a reactionary, neither a complacent liberal or a complacent conservative, and very much um, 
uh, influenced by, I mean, Trilling plays such a big role in, in, her, in, in her thought. It's really striking uh, in this book. And uh, for me personally, rereading this book, parts of this book brought home to me so how interesting a thinker Trilling is, who himself is now caricatured in a certain way, incidentally, not maybe not even that much read anymore. And, and when read, sort of dismissed as a certain type of, 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 of literary critic of a different era. At the end of the book, in the, Trilling's the last essay, um, my mother writes the, uh, uh, she defends moral realism, a phrase of Trilling's, conservatives maybe have a little more of an instinct in that, but the, she then closes, uh, almost ends the book. The element that is still wanting, however, for conservatives as well as liberals is the sense of variety, complexity, and difficulty. Um, this comes in Trilling's case, he, he finds it in the experience of literature, um, but it, it doesn't come just from literature. The moral imagination, which at its best informs the political as well as the literary imagination, requires this kind of appreciation of complexity, qualifications, subtleties, uh, and the like. Um, so I really appreciate all of you for for, for bringing that out. I was, so, I'll, final point, I'll just add one thing. I was so struck when I remember when I read Victorian Minds, you know, I sort of has the impression there are these eras and everyone is kind of mindlessly on board whatever the dominant strain of that era is. And then there's a reaction against it later. And of course there's famously a reaction against the Victorians in the beginning of the 20th century. But none of these Victorians were at all complacent about the era in which they lived. I mean, they were self-critical from the go. I can't actually think of what years was, was Victorianism sort of, regnant and, and un, you know, unproblematic, you know? I mean, you'd think you'd say early, I guess, in Queen Victoria's reign, but like Matthew Arnold, I, I was actually start, startled by this the other day as I was looking, I was gonna quote the lines that everyone quote, the cliche lines from Dover Beach um, and uh, ignorant armies fighting by night and all that. That poem was eight, written in 1850. So that's early in Victoria's reign. That's when everyone's supposed to be all cheerful and happy and progress. And Matthew Arnold, who is a Victorian, presumably as much as anyone is, I, I would think in the general view, uh, is, already, is worrying about, can we survive with a loss of faith? And we have to somehow just uh, love each other. He writes it, I think, on his honeymoon. I mean, you know, because we, we it's otherwise ignorant armies fighting by night. So, so much for wonderful belief in progress. But that's very true, I think, of her work in, in general, the, the kind of appreciation of complexity and the, the ref, refusal of the simplicities of, of right and left. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. I'd like to uh, open it up to the panelists now and uh, just encourage, uh, do any of you have uh, questions of each other or comments of each other or what? who would like to go first? But I'll just say to Sam that I, I, my mom had very few papers. I mean, I don't know, she didn't really save this kind of stuff. So you've probably seen more than I have. I mean, Wisconsin, I think has um, my father's papers such as they were, which is really just whatever was in the files of the public interest when they closed the magazine. But it probably has some stuff that's relevant, but I could also, we could talk sometime about whether there's other material, but I think I, I she didn't have such a high view of her own work that it was required that every draft that she wrote of these essays be, be preserved and so forth. Okay. Let me remind the audience to send in their questions, but in the meantime, anyone else on the panel? Well, uh, one of the things that I noted in looking over some of the essays uh, to prepare for today was that I, I reread Trilling's introduction to the liberal imagination uh, after having read a good deal of um, Himmelfarb. And I'm reminded that she was a much better writer than Trilling. <laughs> With Trilling, you always get the sense that he's sort of trying too hard. Um, whereas, uh, you know, she, car she carried her learning lightly and, uh, and uh, rather than the sentences being long and ornate, they're often um, varied and so on. Um, and her writing from, from very early on, uh, I mean, I haven't read the early, really early stuff that Sam has read, but I've read some of the early essays from commentary and so on. Um, they're just uh, they're they're written with sparkle, right from the from the word go till you know the, the latest of her stuff that uh, that I've I've taken a look at, and uh, that was a very striking feature of her. Yeah. I would say just as a biographical matter, and she didn't talk about this, rarely talked about this, but you know, I mean, she was. Uh, 
grew up in a modest working class home in Brooklyn, ended up in Chicago. And I, I don't know if Sam, I don't know if this is in, written down somewhere. Maybe she said this somewhere. I think Gottschalk, she showed up there as a grad student in history and Gottschalk, who was pretty well known at the time, I think already, you know, quite distinguished, said, well, it's nice that you're here. What are you doing here or something? And she said, well, I don't know. I applied and they gave me a fellowship and my husband's about to get drafted. So it didn't really matter. I was going to be away from him anyway for the next two, three years. Well, they didn't know how long it would be, but it turned out to be two, three, four years. And, and so I thought this would be a good place to study. I don't think she'd ever been there or had any connection with it. And Gottschalk said to her something like, well, of course, you're never going to get a job, you realize. And she said, oh, you know, <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I mean, she took it that he was referring to her her talent, her, her abilities, but he wasn't. He was, and I can't remember, was, well, of course, you're Jew, you're a woman, you're Jewish. I'm not sure what the third was. Honestly. It's, it's, he said that you have three strikes against you. And she, she remembered, I knew what the first two were, Jewish and woman. The third was that she was from the East Coast and Chicago PhDs, especially in that era, tended to end up teaching in Midwestern colleges and universities. And Gottschalk thought, you know, that was going to be a non-starter for, for her for that third reason. And again, you know more, but then, and I think just generally, I said this in the eulogy, I mean, that she was so bold in a, in her, a mild and unassuming way. So she comes out there to study, the French Revolution was the, her main original interest right. in her MA thesis on Robespierre, but then she ends up doing acting. It's not as if, I don't know if anyone in Chicago was particularly studying acting, so I don't know where that came from, honestly, maybe you do. And then she goes to Cambridge where the papers are and, and has a complicated, I think, slightly relationship with, with Butterfield, but, um, uh, anyway, I mean, she, the degree of just sort of being, I mean, these days, a trailblazer, you know, and all this stuff, then she doesn't get a job. I mean, she doesn't try maybe that hard for one, but she doesn't, no, nope, she's only not off. She writes very well regarded her book. She writes other essays and she's offered a job only in 1965, which is, you know, considerably later uh, at Brooklyn College and then City University. And she enjoyed teaching there for, for 20 years. But again, she haven't made a big deal about any of that, but it is, um, you know, for you know, that others, it is an interesting uh, just career in, in that respect. Well, let me ask uh, all of you a question. To a certain extent, the first part of this was implicit in, in various of your remarks, but I just want you to maybe be a, a little more explicit. What do you think um, is the, the most valuable parts of her corpus, of, of the points that she makes, and where do you think she comes up short? I can tell you one of the books where I think she comes up short, uh, which I skipped over in the interests of um, Christian charity. Uh, and that is her, her book on Darwin and the Darwinian revolution, um, which has like the curate's egg, it's good in parts. Um, uh, its discussion about Darwin's uh, personal life and biography and also about the reception of his ideas and the very differing um, political conclusions that were drawn from them by differing groups uh, in, in his own time and immediately thereafter. Uh, I think it's not very good on the theory itself and uh, the intellectual power and actually perspicacity of the theory, including the the part of the theory having to do with sexual selection, which she dismisses uh, really in a paragraph or two, even though I think it's really important. So um, uh, I think the Darwin book is uh, of her purely intellectual historical works. Um, I, f I, found it the, I found it the weakest. Anyone else? Um, that just, I don't know why she turned to Darwin after yeah. that, and again, not an obvious move. I mean, I do think it does show, uh, I don't know much about, I don't recall it honestly well enough to remember what parts, I mean, the, the, a lot of the intellectual history is very interesting and the reception, as you say, I think the actual analysis of Darwin may not stand up so well, but again, it does a kind of, she was awfully um, uh, brave, I mean, courageous and sort of an, an intrepid maybe in, in her, in addressing these different topics, you know, I mean, I don't know what the what the market was for some historian who had no natural science background to be writing about Darwin in the early 50s, but she got very interested in it. I think she really saw that aspects of his his own journey 
uh, I guess his little journey, but his intellectual journey as well. And, and then the reception had been under or misunderstood. And, and um, so she got very intrigued by it and ended up writing quite a big, a big book on it. But I think that's true if you think of it, she got interested in different things and wrote, and uh, was, maybe this is an advantage of being an independent scholar and not having to you know, check all the boxes on the way up to tenure, but she, uh, she was able to really pursue her own interests. And then she ends up with writing these books on Judaism and, and, and uh, Jewish thought and uh, the treatment of Jews in Britain, and then a, a book on George Eliot. Uh, which was not her, you know, she was not a literary, would not have claimed to be a literary critic. So that, that, that's impressive. I think people these days, I don't know, academics certainly are much less willing to just, I mean, what's really impressive is that she went in all these different directions, but did them very carefully. I mean, maybe she wasn't right all the time, but, and didn't just toss off, you know, opinions or boom, oh, but she really did serious work on an awfully diverse sets, group of thinkers and subjects. I think an important theme that unites some of the some of the work um, has to do with the fact that in a number of her essays she discusses how uh, the increasing implausibility of traditional religion for a wide variety of Victorian thinkers led them to a greater emphasis on morality and a kind of earnestness in their desire to show that one could be moral despite the uh, fading of the plausibility of religious premises. Uh, but then they were also very conscious, she points out in these two books on poverty, of the fact that, uh, that one had to be careful that morality didn't, um, this emphasis on morality didn't just lead to a kind of compassion that did not pay attention to intended and unintended consequences. In other words, uh, earnestness in terms of uh, moral passion uh, was a potential stumbling block in and of itself. I think that's a theme that runs through a number of the of the essays and books that I think is uh, <laughs> still very worth keeping in mind. Yeah, I just want to comment briefly on her um, kind of side hustle as an anthologist. <laughs> We've brought it up with her editing of the Acton essays and then the collection of the Mill essays, but I would also urge everyone um, her two anthologies, uh, one of her uh, late brother, Milton Homelfar of Jews and Gentiles, and then of course of her late husband, Irving, Irving Crystal of the Neoconservative Persuasion. Um, these are posthumous collections, which she edited and uh, compiled and then wrote very um, incisive uh, and moving introductions to, and which it is something to uh, be able to write these introductions about people who, uh, to whom you were so devoted. And um, so this too is an aspect of her work that I think that deserves, um, deserves attention. I want, I want to make just two, two comments, uh, one based on what we've said so far and then second in, in response to Alan. You know, I, I think it's quite interesting to look at this period in, in the later 40s and, and come to grips with how, how different the Cold War liberalism of, of Himmelfarb was from someone like Lionel Trilling, who of course, uh, thought it was crucial to um, acknowledge what was going on in 20th century thought and really was most inspired by Sigmund Freud in reaching a kind of tragic liberalism. Whereas Himmelfarb at times appears um, not to have thought very much of, of real depth happened after the time of, I don't know what, who, Nietzsche, uh, one of her great antagonists, um, or in the 20th century. Uh, and, and that motivated, I think, her return to the 19th century when, you know, in these early years, she was quite interested, not just in religion, but the theology. And I think that captures something about the kind of, of picture which she was trying to build in, in the late 40s, as, as, as Jerry notes, when she returned to London and, you know, started the Darwin Project, she may have gone in a different direction and, and in her mature career wasn't placing the content of religion all that centrally to her thinking, uh, you know, and more interested in, in morality. Where I think she went awry most, I mean, I'm the only non-conservative on this panel, so nobody's perfect. So I'm not gonna speak about say the, the content of her political views, but she became so alienated from her colleagues in the profession of history and really in some ways in the university, um, maybe fairly for not kind of um, respecting the kinds of views she had that 
I think she often misunderstood what they were doing. Jerry was right that she had some justified criticism of trends in the historical profession, but other essays, um, books like On Looking Into the Abyss and some of the, 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 the other writings uh, kind of hectoring the historical profession, I think we're, we're not as well informed as and, ha and won't last uh, stay that stand the test of time. But I, I agree entirely with Jerry that her her depictions of Victorian intellectuals are, you know, enduringly valuable. And Sam, can you just say another word about what you consider to be her distinctive Cold War liberalism or, or and her at the origins of that? Well, so. Uh, just to go back to my presentation, she's 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 very concerned about the French Revolution during the the war. Um, she, as Bill points out, she went there to with to work with Gottschalk on it. But um, unlike Gottschalk, takes a pretty critical view of the French Revolution during the war when the Soviets were our ally, fighting the Axis alone on the continent until June 1944. Um, that's the date, practically, of her MA thesis. And then she turns, I mean, I think extraordinarily for a, a young Jewish woman to, to, to reviving Acton, not, uh, whose, whose writings had not been really compiled um, and whose archives had not been plumbed. It's, it's kind of an extraordinary decision. So what I, I wanted to get at there was um, looking at why she thought that kind of um, religiosity may have mattered in grounding a credible political liberalism after World War II that could withstand the right that had just been beaten, including, you know, the participation of the religious right in Europe in fascism, but also the ascendant left and planning left. So um, I, I think she caught the, the, the kind of temper of the times there in a very different way than she did decades later when she was part of the neoconservative movement and the Reagan revolution and the, the thinking that I think both Jerry and especially Matt captured that went along with those events. Your suggestion is that um, in studying the French revolution, she was interested in sort of revolutionary politics and thought per se to shed light on what was going on in the Soviet Union. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she, I mean, one of the book of hers, I'd say that I hear the most about generally, perhaps, especially true in Europe, I'm struck by is the three roads to modernity or, you know, the, which really is a defense, I mean, account, but also defense of the Anglo-American Enlightenment as opposed to the French Enlightenment and therefore the French Revolution. So I, I, I agree with Sam. She was very interested in, in always in the, uh, the ways in which, I mean, she didn't like, she wasn't that taken with the earlier 20th century thinkers who were so dominant. One forgets this so much today, right? You know, Freud and so forth with for like trailing. But, um, but she was taken by the fact, I mean, she was so struck by the fact, how could you not be of fascism on the one hand or Nazism and communism on the other? And, and that somehow uh, liberalism in the broadest sense of liberalism needed to be appreciated, defended, understood, complexified, find new sources of defense, whether it's more orthodox religion or tradition, a la Burke, or other understand literary, other forms of the moral imagination, uh, or Tovillian, you know, complexifying and so forth. So that was really, I think, always motivated her. I'll, I'll just tell one story, and I, I wish I, I should have written it down at the time, so I'm, I, I, but I remember it fairly accurately. I, um, this was, I mean, this was ages ago, uh, literally almost 50 years ago. I, so I took a course at Harvard came back to Mimes, I discussed it with her three or four years ago, so I'm not just making this up from ancient memories, but I took a course at Harvard um, as an undergraduate on 20th century philosophy, but this was, the course was really an excuse for Mark Blitz, my teacher there, who's still teaching, uh, to teach Heidegger, which he'd written his PhD <laughs> dissertation on, uh, but he, I, I they didn't want to just teach Heidegger, so they, he taught um, Bergson and Dewey and I think Niebuhr and other thinkers who, to be honest, I don't believe were Heidegger's level, and certainly Mark didn't think they were, and certainly didn't present them as that. But that way, it was a little more of a survey of sort of five, I can't remember, five, I think famous 20th century philosophers. And I remember coming home and telling my parents, telling my, my mother, you know, I was really, this course was terrific, and Heidegger was just amazing. And I mean, I was in love with Heidegger, but I mean, it was so jaw dropping and, and all this. And, and I was interested in Strauss and Strauss and Heidegger and all this. This is more of a 
you know, Jacob Taubus kind of thing, I guess. And, um, and they were, they had been interested in all that too. And of course, my mother had written the first review of a book by Strauss in any mainstream American journal and commentary. And it wasn't her field at all, Xenophon and classics, but she appreciated it, you know? And so she, so she appreciated all that on the intellectual side. But I was then said something about Dewey. I mean, Dewey really is kind of a lightweight, I said, you know, compared to these other thinkers. And, um, you know, that kind of community progressivism, I don't even remember it that well, but, you know. Um, and, uh, and she said, and Niebuhr, you know, okay, but, and she said something like, yeah, but, you know, I was, she said, she said I was alive then. <laughs> and, you know, they weren't the deepest thinkers, perhaps, but they were right on the big issue. You know, they stood up against, the fascists and they stood up against the communists. And you've got to not just give them credit for that, but think a little bit about why that was. And, and maybe they wouldn't fully, you know, maybe their thought isn't sufficient to continue uh, a kind of healthy liberalism, but at least there, she was, she understood that in that respect, the difference between theory and practice or, and also the out of respect for a kind of basic uh, common sense, you might say, but also courage of thinkers like, like Dewey and Debor when I was excessively contemptuous of them because they didn't stand up to, to Heidegger. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question to Matt and then we'll go to Q and A uh, from our audience. And Matt, I don't know if you remember this or if it was apparent to you from the students you taught when you taught at, at AU, but our students are generally uh, regarded as the politically most active or among the politically most active in the country. And so the reason they come here is to be in DC and to try and make a difference and try and make a change. So to, to students like that, who really want to get involved and, uh, and, uh, and make a difference, but maybe are not so philosophically or broadly trained, what do you think is the, uh, the most important lesson or one of the important lessons that they should get from, uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb and what suggestion might you have for them to read? Well, I, I, I mean, I think in, on the one hand, um, B's life kind of illustrates the value in uh, doing the work and becoming, knowing your subject uh, before you uh, venture off into uh, outside fields. And I think it was Irving Crystal who said, you know, the definition of an intellectual is someone who speaks with great authority on a subject on which he has no expertise, right? <laughs> and uh, there are many, many, many young intellectuals by that definition today. Uh, but I think he also always appreciated uh, what B did because she actually knew <laughs> what she was talking about when it came to Victorian England and the thinkers that she studied. And this is a thought about her, a remark about her writing, which people brought up and she was a beautiful writer, but I, don't, I never got the impression that she really enjoyed writing all that much. She was a heavy rewriter. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the essays in um, The Moral Imagination and Past and Present were, were continually revised because she was never quite satisfied with it. A lot of work went into it. And so whenever I speak to young people, including my students, uh, I always want to convey to them the importance of doing the work. Um, and for people who are involved in politics, obviously that work is slightly different than intellectual activity. But I think um, knowing your subject, even if it is organizing, uh, will, will give you the um, experiences that you can then translate into into other fields. Uh, so, sobering advice to the students, uh, slow down and actually learn and know what you're No one ever seems to take this advice though, yeah. that's the problem. <laughs> okay, so we've got a handful of questions. Let me uh, uh, begin. Um, we've, uh, uh, so I'm trying to look for a few student uh, questions first. Uh, Okay, here's, here's a student from, uh, a question from Grace Weinberg, who is a freshman at American University. My question for anyone on the panel is how we've seen Himmelfarb's theories and ideas about morality and conservatism manifest themselves in recent events, such as Brexit and the Trump presidency. I, mean, I could say, well, I mean, she was anti-Trump and uh, or at least told me she was, I guess to make me happy, but no, I think she was a, a standard kind of conservative um, 
never Trump attitude and uh, but didn't repudiate you know her, her uh, belief in broadly conservative policies in a lot of areas. Brexit's an interesting thing because she was I mean she was not an enthusiast for it. I don't know that she opined it. I don't think she ever wrote anything about it in, in print, but on the one hand, she loved Britain. You know, she really did like Britain and British thought and British life and British thinkers. She was a bit of an Anglophile, I guess, and obviously spent all those decades studying Britain. But I think she was also pretty disciplined about not letting nostalgia govern, govern future choices in politics. And while she was no, I'm sure she was very, she was friendly to some of the arguments against the EU and so forth. I don't recall her ever, she could have weighed in on Brexit and she said, I don't recall her ever doing so. Matt, do you think she ever spoke about it? Mark? I mean, not not publicly. I mean, one of her last essays was a review of a biography of Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, who herself was very skeptical. Um, this, for, to address this question just briefly, it was interesting to me, um, uh, one of another of her first essays for the Weekly Standard was a defense of the Republican Revolution, and th that very it, that very phrase, the defense of revolution, uh, from a conservative perspective, written in 1995, and she was saying that at some point uh, institutions become so debased or demoralized that you do need something like a counter revolution, is the the uh, word she used that, to um, correct them. Now it's interesting though is that several years later, the conservative intellectual move movement became embroiled in this debate uh, over uh, judicial activism, uh, sparked by a symposium in First Things magazine, that basically uh, raised the question of whether America had become a t a a tyrannical, the judiciary had become tyrannical, and whether a right to revolution might be invoked. And B uh, weighed in heavily against this notion, and she actually resigned from the First Things um, editorial advisory committee and in a subsequent symposium, neocons like having symposiums, in a subsequent symposium and commentary, she actually somewhat um, qualified her earlier view on the necessity of a, a Republican revolution. She backed away, I think, um, because she saw how it might manifest itself uh, with that first things, uh, um, series of essays, um, the end of democracy, question mark was, was the title of the symposium. And I think she felt very similarly about what happened in the Trump era. And um, as I kind of uh, alluded to in my remarks, um, the, the, the categories of morality that were so important to the right in the 1990s and kind of leading up uh, in the first year or so of the Bush administration and still, I mean, just kind of moved to the side once 9-11 uh, happened, um, had collapsed by the time that Bush, uh, that rather by the time Trump arrived the scene, on the scene. The, the, the discourse of morality was not something that you found in much of uh, in conservative writing. Um, instead, you found actually that rhetoric of revolution uh, that, that she had been warning against um, in 1997. Okay, we've got a comment from Leon Cass, our friend Leon Cass. Reading the Darwin book while I was still in the laboratory opened my eyes to the still open philosophical questions neglected by confident current science, including especially the presence of teleology, of purposiveness in a seemingly materialist account of life. It was the beginning of my own examination of philosophical issues of modern biology. So I think, Jerry, this might be directed at you. Um, do, would you like to respond to that? It shows you that even a, a flawed book can have a very positive influence on a great mind. <laughs> okay, anyone else respond to that? Okay, we've got a question from Abe Shulsky of the Hudson Institute. Did Gertrude Himmelfarb ever write about post-Victorians of the Bloomsbury set? Did she ever discuss what caused them to reject the Victorian era so passionately, thus giving rise to the quote unquote conventional understanding of the Victorian era as a priggish and limited in intellectual breadth? I think Jerry's pulling up the book right now, which is Marriage yeah. and Morals Among the Victorians, where she yeah. deals most specifically with, with Bloomsbury. Right, there's an essay called A Genealogy of Morals from Clapham to Bloomsbury, which traces the uh, changing generational uh, reactions, and uh, it's a great essay. I once, just a personal remark, I once said to her, 
uh, I just read Marriage and Morals Among the Victorians and it's wonderful. And she looked at me and she said, why were you reading that? <laughs> she, often, she was often very surprised that people were paying attention uh, to works that she had written decades before. Like, I, I just was struck by Leon Cass, who was uh, you know, probably my mom's closest friends in the last uh, decade and very close to my, my, both my parents for, for decades, wow. really, from the 50 years, something like that. And it's, it's lovely that Leon wrote, wrote such a nice, sent in such a nice comment. And I thought Jerry's answer was, was actually, I mean, it was very uh, witty and well, not just witty, but very perceptive and uh, deft, I would say. But it really is an interesting point, isn't it? That I mean, uh, yeah, you if you explore something seriously, you may not be right ultimately, or or entirely right about every aspect of what you looked at, but you can you can open up things that people haven't uh, thought about. And young readers, and I guess Leon would have been quite young uh, um, when he encountered that book, uh, can see things and can then take things in very very different ways and, and, and in very new directions and very promising and very important directions in the case of Leon's work. So I, I think it's a, it's a, it, was, it was just to emphasize earnestly the, it was such a deft, the point was made with such, such a deft and light touch that I'm just going to say that people really should think about that. Now, you're not gonna be right about everything that you write and uh, you'll rethink your interpretations. My mom certainly did. But you know, you don't know what young people or others, uh, not so young, you're you're perhaps encouraging to think for themselves, and that's very important. Yeah, good, nice, and that that's uh, the importance of teaching books with different points of view, even if you disagree with them, right? And and uh, having discussions with different points of view, um, not all of which will be right or can't be right but to uh, prod and probe and make people see things in different lights. And that's what we try to do here at the Political Theory Institute. Okay, the next question is for Sam Moyne. Sam, could you perhaps, it's from Justin Gottschalk. Could you perhaps say more about Himmelfarb's idea of Lord Acton's appeal to or reliance on some type of trans historical basis? So it, in, in, the Lord Acton book, though he was of course a, a historian and uh, writing about the emergence of, of liberty and in, in the West and in some of his most famous essays, she located a, a, a commitment to ultimately, you know, real, a, a kind of eternal truth of, of religious vintage. And it, it's partly that that led him in his life to struggle against uh, the, the, the papal events that so much of Himmelfarb's first book uh, are, uh, are about, uh, but also to defend freedom in this Victorian situation in his way. So I, I just think it's interesting that in one of the letters I have from 1947, back from Himmelfarb to Gottschalk explaining what she's done with her with her year, Himmelfarb remarks that she attended this lecture by Friedrich Hayek, where he he was trying to establish a kind of um, identity between Acton and figures like Burke and Tocqueville. And in the letter, she says, "I think that's wrong, and I'm right, going to write my own article about why that's wrong." And that's this piece on the American Revolution, which I showed you. And she starts out the article saying Hayek is, is mistaken uh, in assimilating these figures because Acton's defense of the revolution was based on something like the American defense of eternal truth, um, not kind of the Burkean understanding of those events is based on kind of the rights of Englishmen as evolved through history and tradition. Um, and that's what that article is about. So uh, I think it's quite interesting that uh, she's, she's in this moment, seemingly of the later 40s, like Crystal writing in kind of a neo-Orthodox spirit against various liberal rabbis and commentary, very interested in the contents of religion. Um, and that was true for Butterfield and some of these other kind of founding Cold War liberals. And so, I, 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 and it's also at this moment when she's praising Leo Strauss, who has somewhat similar commitments, less, less emphasis on, on the kind of religious vintage of, um, you know, trans trans historical um, truth. So, 
I, I, I don't want to say much more than that, but it's it's an interesting moment in which she she seems to credit Acton with views that are 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 not you know don't have a monopoly on conservative thinking then or now. Okay, so we have a similar question. I, I think this is also for you, Sam, uh, from my colleague at AU, Borden Flanagan. Um, did Himmelfarb treat morality, including the need for a grounding in universal principle from the standpoint of social utility? Should we ground morality because doing so is more effective? How did this question affect her thinking about the best grounds? So, you know, we, Alan and I discussed earlier whether we can take, uh, when, when people write about others, whether they're speaking about themselves too. It's very hard to make, you know, very clear um, arguments about what Himmelfarb thought about Acton's views because, she, in you know, officially she was just reporting them. But no, he he was not a utilitarian, and she didn't uh, think that his claims about uh, universal principle should be appreciated because they were, you know validated by through kind of the results to which they led. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, Bill. I mean, I, I should go back and look at the Acton stuff, which I haven't looked at in quite a long time. And I mean, and then I say nothing of Acton himself on the American Revolution, but I, I do think I know a little bit about the sort of history of people's writing about the American founding, revolution and founding. And I think uh, that understanding of Acton's understanding, which was to some degree uh, the understanding my mother wanted to defend, it was very unconventional. That is to say, the standard conservative understanding was even more than Burke, honestly, a kind of rights of Englishmen. It was a conservative revolution. It was it was uh, very much preserving the old the, the revolution of 1689 and, and so forth, and 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 much better than all those terrible you know European revolutions. And then the the um, and then the sort of left understanding was really at that point still a kind of mar semi-Marxist understanding of, you know, uh, property owners and, you know, Hamilton and Madison versus whatever, you know, the, that kind of Charles Beard, I guess you'd say thing. Um, and I, my parents were very close to, I think, people mostly for Chicago, though, political science students, students of Strauss directly and indirectly, like Marty Diamond and Herbert Story and Harry Jaffa, and, who in different ways, and they all went in different directions, ultimately, but still try to ground kind of the principles of the American Revolution, and but you might also say the American Enlightenment, in a sort of more in a more solid way than perhaps you can with a kind of pure Burkean uh, traditionalism, but in a less radical way, in a way that resists the radicalism of the French Revolution, and so I, I but I hadn't realized that, that 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 began way back with with Acton, which really precedes by quite a lot the 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 sort of important essays that come out of that tradition by Storing and Joffe and so forth. are really mid late fifties, and then after Joffe's book on Lincoln is fifty nine. So that's interesting that um, way way that I hadn't realized honestly that 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 that's was central to her thought in, in that article. When's that article from? 1949. Okay, we've got three more questions. We have one now from Jake Leiter of Marley Cooling Towers. Thank you all for speaking with us today on the work of a remarkable woman. In an essay for the nation on the occasion of reviewing one of Jonathan Israel's recent volumes on the Enlightenment, Professor Moyne mentioned Himmelfarb's Roads to Modernity as an example in the historiography of the Enlightenment that does not fall into the trap of painting too broadly the people and thought of the Enlightenment, which is very common even among professional historians. Why was Himmelfarb able to not fall into this trap? And what was it about her study in historical thought that enabled her intellectual nuance? You know, it's an excellent question. Just briefly, um, you know, I, I remarked earlier that that she became increasingly alienated from the historical profession. But here is one uh, you know, topic on which she actually kind of approximated you know, the way that the Enlightenment began to be discussed. Um, she, she did it in her own way. But what we've seen is um, much more focus on the diversity of Enlightenments nationally and in other ways, and much more work on um, the the on on England as its own site of enlightenment, which really had had been you know left out of 
some of the major studies by Peter Gay and others um, as, as, as its own distinctive center, you know, connected with the Scottish Enlightenment. So what, what led Himmelfarb to that kind of resonance with the way the literature has gone and our kind of bigger collective understanding of the diversity of the Enlightenment, as I think that um, from the earliest time, you know, as I tried to show, she was very skeptical of, of where the Enlightenment had led France. Uh, and she was impressed by these other tendencies. Now, note that um, in the Lord Acton study is so distinctive because it's, it's, there's a great deal of it that's about Central European intellectual life in the 19th century because Acton was, was Anglo-German and most of his you know, core ideas are really in kind of developing in conversation uh, with, with Central Europeans uh, and, and especially in, in, in Catholic transnational networks. So she, she was, she from that date, she, I think she, she really appreciated that France wasn't the only game in town and the, the anti-clerical version of the enlightenment uh, was not the road into the 19th century that she wanted to follow. Or did in in her life you know, I, I suppose i think that's so interesting i mean I, I do have the sense that coming to it from studying british thinkers would in her case at least led led in the, on the path you suggested which has now become a little more i think the mainstream path and the rediscovery of the scottish enlightenment so, i mean i'm old enough older than everyone else in Scotland, to remember that and the enlightenment just used to be the french enlightenment yeah <laughs> i mean sort of literally i mean if you just talked about the enlightenment i mean it is you know and, and then it was sort of the, it was Voltaire and all that, and Diderot and the Encyclopédie, and then it goes to kind of to Kant in some complicated way, and then to Hegel, and that's, and then you're off to the races with, you know, various forms of Hegelians and Marx and stuff. And, and I do think that in that respect, I mean, many historians have now done work and many political theorists, obviously, on, on a lot of these different thinkers, but yeah, I, I think one forgets, uh, uh, I'm not sure about this, but my sense is that that was a much more unusual focus in the late 40s and 50s than it now seems to us. Yeah. And Jerry, if I could just add quickly, I, I do think you also have to look at the influence of Trilling here yeah. and his emphasis on particularity and what the teaching of the experience of literature and how it might be translated into historiography. Um, and, and all this sense that everything needs to be complicated. Um, you have to search out the nuances and you have to see what's missing in the picture. So she was always wary of making sweeping generalizations. And what's funny is that Irving Kristol's work often included these sweeping generalizations. So they, the two complemented each other in that sense as well. Okay, we've got two questions left, but they're pretty big ones. The first one is from my colleague, Tom Merrill. What was Himmelfarb's judgment of Leo Strauss? What about William F. Buckley? I mean, I'll, just, you know, I'll say a word about Strauss. I mean, so she, I mean, she was not a Straussian. She didn't herself, she read books carefully and was attentive to the ironies and complexities of them, but wasn't you know, a student of Strauss's and uh, many of her, her friends, my father's friends were, had be, been, became students of Strauss and were students of Strauss. And obviously they were very much in those, moved in those circles and I, I did too, um, whatever that's worth. But, but I mean, it is very startling to read her review of Strauss of Zeta. So the first book, Strauss in a perverse way, decides to publish in America, is this unbelievably uh, close and kind of brilliant reading of, uh, of Xenophon, of the hero. Like, let's pick an author who's totally unknown, neglected, and has people have contempt for. Let's not even pick one of his Socratic dialogues. Let's just pick this kind of bizarro, I mean, if I can say, di you know, dialogue with Simonides. And I'm going to show you that it's got unbelievable depths and complexity and stuff. So this was, Strauss did this, I believe, for his own pedagogic reasons. But my mother really appreciated it. I mean, she, I mean, she says, I think in the review virtually, like, I'm not really gonna qualify. I don't, you know, she's no Greek. I mean, you know, I'm not qualified to judge this in some technical lack or in an academic sense, but this is just extremely impressive and extremely important. And, um, and then my father actually wrote a review of uh, essay on Strauss and commentary in 52 or 53. So neither was themselves students of texts in the Straussian manner, but, I think both were very influenced by Strauss. But again, what is ultimately, I mean, so many things in Strauss, but one of the things in Strauss that's most striking is 
all this facile progressivism is not right. That these ancient thinkers thought much more deeply than you realize. They are not simply uh, supplanted in some Hegelian way by later waves of thought. They can't be reduced to their circumstances, to the social conditions of their time. And they need to be read you know, seriously and as if they might even uh, have understood the truth. So in that respect, I think her, her own mode is compatible with Strauss's overall uh, manner and teaching, even though not, not herself uh, uh, quite a Straussian. Jerry? Thomas, who, who I'm looking forward to Jerry's book on this, I think had a big influence, who was a, I don't even know how to describe him, but who was a odd student or I guess contemporary really of Strauss. Um, they had a reading group, didn't they, in the late 40s in New York? Yes. And I think, I think 19, that had some influence on my parents. In 1949, Jacob Taubus, who was a postgraduate student at the Jewish Theological Seminary had been studying Maimonides with Strauss. And then uh, he ran a seminar that was attended by uh, Irving Kristol and Gertrude Himmelfarb and Daniel Bell and Nathan Glazer and Arthur A. Cohen and a few other people in which they explored a particular work of Maimonides, uh, the Sefer Hamada, And in it, uh, Taubus conveyed to them Strauss's understanding of Maimonides and his understanding of the political uses of religion, uh, despite what the philosopher may consider its lack of veracity. And uh, one does find such views reflected in the 1949 uh, commentary essay that Sam talked about, and also in an essay that uh, Irving Kristol published around 1950. Um, in which, uh, in which he makes some use of these ideas. So their actual exposure to Straussian ideas uh, came before they read Strauss, uh, but then shortly thereafter, they, they did read Strauss in the original, as it were. Anyone on Himmelfarb on William F. Buckley? Bill, you might know more of the, about the personal, my general sense was she and Irving shared the same attitude toward National Review conservatism, which was very skeptical at first, and um, and indeed critical of, of National Review for mo for the, its first decades. But then, I think Irving became uh, lunch um, companions with Bill Buckley sometime in the late seventies, and so the, there was a friendship there. Um, but that there was always a sense that that National Review conservatism was something very distinct um, from from their their neoconservatism. Okay, we've got the last question for the evening. It's it's a good one. I think uh, th there there might be a presupposition in the question, but it's a nice way to end. It's from David Leibowitz in AU undergrad. Based on what is Himmelfarb's ideology conservative, and what exactly did she desire to conserve? Well, it's a it's a complicated question because conservative means so many things to so many different people. Um, and then there's a way that when you think about the, the two thinkers, um, Adam Smith and Edmund Burke, uh, who uh, B and Irving both studied so closely, uh, neither one was a conservative in a sense. Adam Smith had his system of natural liberty and Edmund Burke was a Whig, he, he was a reformer. So um, what they were, I think, um, they were they were Whigs. They were skeptical Whigs, um, uh, is how I think Daniel Bell put it in, in something I was just reading recently. So you knew that reform was necessary. You knew that you were not. There was no way of turning back the clock. But you also knew that um, the improvement in the world does not come easily, and it often has unintended consequences that could make the situation worse. And so, in, if if you just cast off all of the fetters of tradition in this kind of facile belief in, in uh, ultimate progress. Um, you might have a, a society that's worse off than it was before. And by American standards in the late 20th century, that put them on the political right. But, um, but that center of gravity is always shifting. And it's one reason why I think um, uh, B did not like Trump at all. Uh, and, and so she would not find herself, I think, in alliance with many on the right today. Nice. Anyone else? Well, that's a. That's... I'll just say that you know there was a, there used to be a saying that the Conservative Party in England was the uh, what, what the Anglican Church of Prayer. 
So I remember thinking at B's memorial service uh, after she passed away, the, the hall, the synagogue was, was full and I thought to myself, here's the anti-Trumpian conservative intelligentsia <laughs> prayer. <laughs> Okay. Well, on that note, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to uh, all my colleagues at AU and the communications team for helping make this possible. Um, it was a really interesting panel on uh, a scholar who has done great work, as I think you've all explained, and is not that widely known um, today. I mean, you know, we all know them, you know them, uh, but but not in the in the, amongst the general public. And so I hope uh, people in our audience uh, will have learned something and might turn towards her. So thank you all very much. And thanks to the audience for coming. Bye, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you.